Hello, and welcome to the BYU Family History Webinar Series. I'm Marin, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Uh, just so you know, uh, if you could turn off your microphones and your video options on Zoom, uh, that would be great. We want to be able to have a smooth and uh, clear presentation. So just a reminder to turn off your video and your mics uh, during the presentation. Um, today, we have our webinar with Catherine Grant, uh, who will be giving a presentation entitled uh, Making Getting the Most Out of a Family Search Family Tree, Sources on the Person page. Uh, next webinar will be a follow-up on this webinar with Catherine Grant, and that will be on the 13th, uh, Thursday at 4 p.m. Mountain uh, Standard Time. Um, in way of announcements, the 13th will be our last webinar of the year, but we'll be back in January. And before the 13th, there will be an updated tentative schedule for January. Um, if you have any comments or questions, you're welcome to email at FHL underscore webinars at BYU.edu. And of course, this recording, uh, the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube page and our website. Um, and if you would like updates, you're welcome to join our social media channels. We have a Twitter, a Facebook, and a YouTube page. And uh, just one moment as I get uh, things set up. Okay. Well, everybody, welcome to our webinar today. It's so good to have you with us. And we will be talking about sources on the person page. This is another webinar in our series on getting the most from Family Search Family Tree. So if you've missed the previous webinars that talk about other functions on the person page, you can look those up on YouTube. So we're so grateful that you joined us today. And let's take a look at what we're going to be covering. So I have to tell you that when I started to working on this webinar, it was getting way long and I thought this is just not going to work. There's too much stuff. So that's one reason that we broke it into two parts. So today in part one, we're going to talk about sources in family history and just kind of talk about some of the basics that are good to know, good to keep in mind as you're dealing with sources. And then the second thing we'll do today is just get to know the sources tab. We'll look at the different features and functions that are available. And then in our next in our, our webinar next week, we'll be talking about how you actually add sources. And we'll talk about two different ways, one from FamilySearch.org and the other from other providers such as, oh, Find a Grave and um, Ancestry.com, different places that are outside of the FamilySearch.org website. So with that said, let's go ahead and dive in. So sources in family history, the basics. If I were to ask you what a family history source is, what would you say? Just give that thought for a few seconds. So here is a brief definition, not, not the only right one, but hopefully a useful one for us today. I would say that a family history source is something that provides evidence about our ancestors' lives. Now that is necessarily vague because because that something could be written, it could be spoken. There are so many ways that we could get evidence about events that happened in our ancestors' lives. Here's an example of, of a traditional source. This is an English christening record, and it has a wealth of information about the child that was christened. So we see that little Agnes here was christened on the 29th of March. Her parents are William and Rebecca Ives. They were living in Bromley at the time, and dad was a police constable. That's kind of an unusual occupation for back then. And then I also am going to give the curate a huge hug when I get to the other 
other side because look what he did out in the margin. He made his own column for the birth date of the person who was christened or baptized. And so now for this record, I have not only that christening date, but I also have her birth date. So this is an example of a traditional source that gives me information about an event, a baptism or christening, that happened in Agnes Ives' life. Well, let's look at a different type of source. Here we've got two gals talking to each other using that, you know, did I don't know if any of you ever played with those when you were kids, how you take a, a tin can or something, put a string on it and pretend to be talking to each other. Although I have to say that my uh, niece and nephew play texting. They don't play with stuff like this. So probably a lot of kids don't do this anymore, but once upon a time we did. Anyway, is a conversation between friends a source? Well, absolutely it is. If they're talking about something to do with genealogy or something to do with somebody's life, then that can legitimately be considered a source. But that raises the issue that some sources are more reliable than others. So what makes a source reliable? There are probably a number of things, but I wanted to focus on three aspects of what makes a source reliable. The first one is that there is firsthand knowledge on the part of the informant or recorder. So that christening record was very likely recorded by the curate and the person who performed the ceremony and probably pretty soon after the ceremony took place. And so, and he was probably involved with it. He was probably the one who performed it. Occasionally, I'm sure there were clerks that recorded things instead of the, the clergyman. But in this case, there was very likely some firsthand knowledge there that makes that record very reliable. Second is the trustworthiness of the informant or recorder. Now, most of the time, people are trustworthy when they're making records, but I did want to comment on two rather humorous times when uh, the people might not be as trustworthy. So one of those, the example that I can give is something that probably you've noticed, is that in some of the older censuses that are 10 years apart, women don't age 10 years between the censuses. Well, that's, you know, things don't change over time. We women are always trying to be younger, right? Most of us or look younger or whatever. And so it's just, and a lot of times people weren't maybe educated and so numbers just weren't a big deal for them. But whatever the case was, we, we do from time to time see women not aging 10 years during 10 years. Now, another thing so that we don't leave the men out, a time when men tend to be dishonest on records is on military records. So if a war is popular, they may exaggerate their age or their weight or something so that they can go to war and fight for their country. It's a noble cause, right? Uh, and if the war is unpopular, perhaps there's they will uh, be dishonest on a record because they want to get out of going to war. So anyway, there are times it's just good to be aware of how trustworthy the informant or recorder is for a particular record. And then finally, an important thing to consider is how much time has elapsed between the event and when it was recorded. So if a curate or a clergyman recorded a baptism within minutes or hours after it took place, I would consider that highly reliable because he's got firsthand knowledge and enough time has not elapsed to interfere with his memory. But if we're talking about somebody, maybe a godparent recording a christening months after the fact or even years after the fact, maybe putting it in a family Bible or something, oh, well, we all know what happens to memory over time, right? It becomes less reliable and uh, we might mix it up with other events or so forth. Another comment in this regard on christenings, some, or excuse me, on census records is what I meant to say. 
sometimes in a census, well, often actually in a census, you'll notice that ages are not consistent. And so you might wonder, which age do I trust? Okay, in the 61, the 71, the 81, the 91, they're all different. They're like three or four years off. Well, this is another case where that same principle applies that the closer to an event, the record is, the more accurate it is. So if a child was born, say, in 1855, and then they're recorded in the 1861 census, that is probably going to be pretty accurate as far as the child's age, because at that age, it's easy to tell. And you know, you don't mix up a two-year-old and a seven-year-old, right? Whereas you could mix up a 42-year-old and a 47-year-old. So in, you want to stick with the earliest record, the one that's closest to the time of the event, and normally that's going to be the most accurate one. I also wanted to make a comment about how we record sources these days. In the olden days, we used to record sources by the name of the source. And if that's not quite making sense, I'm going to have an illustration on the next slide. But for instance, if, if uh, somebody, if we wanted to attach an 1881 census to somebody, we would just call it the 1881 census. But with the advent of digital sources and hinting and different technologies that make our lives so much easier, we now want to attach sources by the name of the person within the record, not just the, by the source or the name of the record. So here's a little, oops, went too fast there. Here's a little illustration that shows the difference between the two. So the old way was just to consider the 1881 census, for example, as a source. And you would attach that source to all members of the family. So here we've got a little family made of John, Susan, Alfred, and James. And I would just attach that same source to each one of them. But now with hinting and advanced searching and so forth, it works much better for technology to label the source by the name of the person that it's about. So we now don't just have the 1881 census applied to whoever's in that family, but instead we've got a source for John in the 1881, Susan in the 1881, Alfred and James. And those to the system, those are all considered separate sources. You might have noticed in family tree sometimes that people maybe don't understand this new way of doing it and they'll take the source for John and then they'll attach it to everybody in the family. So you go to Susan's page and the source says John in the 1881 census and you go to Alfred's and it says John in the 1881 census. Well, you might think, what's the big deal? It just, you know, the name's a little off, but it's still the right record. Well, in, I believe it was a training meeting that I was in where a, a brother from Family Search spoke, and he said that actually when we attach the wrong record to a person, so if I put John's source on Alfred, that's basically telling Family Tree that Alfred is John. And so it's going to bring up hints for John on Alfred's page. And so it's basically going to make things harder for hinting and harder for people that are working on the records. So we do want to be careful when we're attaching sources to attach the source by the name of the person. If that isn't clear or if you have questions about that, please do feel free to put a question in the question box and we will answer all questions at the end of the webinar. I did want to say one more thing about sources. So would you consider sources a necessary evil? I think there are a lot of people who do. Sources are often considered tedious, boring, difficult to use. But do you know what I've noticed? I think a lot of that is just an attitude, just a mindset that may be based on you know, bad experiences in high school when you have to attach sources to a, to a term paper or something. But as I've gotten into family history more and as I've kind of, I would have to say, fallen in love with sources, I've realized just how powerful they are to turn hearts. 
when we look at a source, we are looking at the record of something important that happened to somebody that we love, somebody who's part of our family, whether we've ever met them or not. And so I am guessing that I'm probably preaching to the choir to most of you that are listening. But if you have a chance to teach other people to love sources, I would encourage you to do that. Help them overcome their fear of using and attaching sources and help them see what an advantage, what a benefit it is in turning their hearts to their family member that they can get to know this person better through the source. So uh, that's just my little encouragement to look at sources more positively. Okay, let's dive in now to how we can use the Sources tab in Family Tree. So the way you access the Sources tab is pretty straightforward just by clicking this uh, Sources. It doesn't really look like a tab, but I've noticed they call it a tab. So by clicking this uh, tab right here, and that way you will go over to the Sources tab, and this is what you'll see. If sources have been added, you will see all the sources that have been attached to the person. And this looks pretty straightforward, doesn't it? But it's deceptively simple. There's actually a lot more functionality and a lot more power in the sources tab than we might realize. So let's look first at the icons over on the left hand side. You notice they're not all the same. And there's actually a different icon that's not shown in this example, but here it is. So these are the icons that I've noticed. And if anybody has noticed different icons, maybe you could make a comment in the chat. But these are the three that I've noticed when I've been working on sources. The first one, the little tree icon, you'll recognize that looks like a Family Search logo, right? And that is because anything with this little tree means that that source came from Family Search Historical Records. It is a Family Search Historical Record. If you see this icon, the little scrapbook icon, it's because somebody has created a memory in Family Tree and then they've attached it as a source. So an example of doing that is that I have found some christening records that are not in Family Search historical records. So I've created a memory out of them and then I've attached them to the person in Family Tree. And then finally, we've got this globe, and that's basically for everything else. So if you've attached a record from Find a Grave or Ancestry or wherever else you may have gotten it from, it will have this little globe on it. Did you know that you can drag sources to reorder them? It used to be that we had little arrows off to the side, but no longer. Now you just click the source and you drag it. And for instance, on this one, I want my sources in chronological order. So I've got a christening here, then I've got a 71 and an 81. Well, Thomas got married after 81, so I want to drag this source down to the bottom and that's all I do is just uh, like click, hold, and drag it. But you got to be careful there and not actually click and let go because then it will just open the source. So you want to like click and hold and drag it then to the position that you want it. And then it will fall into the place where you want it to be. Okay, here's where we'll look at some of the more exciting functionality for getting the most out of sources. So if you want to see more detail on this source, and I actually don't think this is necessarily intuitive, so a lot of people that you help may not know this, but if you want to see more detail, just click on the source, and it will open up to a, a pop down, I guess you could call it, that looks like this with a lot more information. So you notice the, the name of the source stays there at the top, but you got a bunch more stuff. So let's, I've kind of divided this into three parts so that we can go through each part and get a little more familiar with it. And also this is too small, so we need to divide it into parts so we can have it bigger. So we're going to talk about the first part, the little uh, set of menu items under there, and let's blow it up so it's a little easier to see. 
So we've got a couple or a few menu options here. Let's just go briefly through each one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it because I think that could get really tedious, but I encourage you to explore and kind of poke around and see what you find out and see how this could be useful to you. So the first one is view, and when you click that, you're going to get a screen that looks very much like this. Now what you'll notice almost right away is that this screen has most of the same information that you could already see on the previous page. Well, all that information didn't used to be there. So I kind of think this is, a, this is just my theory, that I think this is probably a holdover from when the information wasn't there. But it does have a few additional things off to the side here where you can see everybody as sources attached to, print it if you want to, and so forth. So it's worth looking into, but to be honest with you, I find that I don't really use that this much. But I wanted you to be aware of it because it could be helpful for you in the future. Okay, let's look at the next one. When you click edit, you actually get a screen that is very similar to the screen that you saw when you added the source, but only three of the items are editable. And those are the three items that are shown in white here and that I've put uh, kind of red circles around. So you might wonder, why would I want to edit these things? Well, sometimes there's mistakes or you want to add extra information or maybe somebody has added a source without adding a reason statement and you want to go in and add one for why that, um, well, here it's changing, but you know, if it's for why the information is correct, it's a great idea to add some, some reasoning there for why it's correct. One thing that applies to this particular screen here where we've got a source title is that you've probably noticed, as I have, that occasionally people will misindex things. For instance, Thomas's last name, Gunton, is sometimes missed in that I've seen it misindexed as Grinton, probably because the person had difficulty reading it on the record. So if this source said Grinton, then somebody might look at it in the source list and go, why is this attached? This doesn't even look like it's for the right person. So in that case, I would probably want to go in here and edit Grinton to be Gunton, which is the correct last name. Now there's a small caveat about that. I was in a meeting and we asked a family search representative about doing this and he said, yes, you can absolutely do this, but just be aware that if we ever decided to refresh the source titles, it would undo your changes. And the only time they'd ever do that is if they were doing some kind of mass change to a whole bunch of sources in Family Tree. So the chances of that happening are remote but it could happen. So I just wanted to mention that just so that you know that it's not likely that your edits will be lost, but there is a very slight possibility. And for me, it's worth it to make the correction because most likely it's going to be there for a long time. Okay, the next one, Review Attachments, when you click that, you are going to get taken to the Source Linker page. So you will just be able to see who that record has been attached to. And this is actually a great example of what we were talking about, how the same record is now attached by name to different individuals. So we've got Thomas Joshua Gunton in the record attached to Thomas Joshua Gunton in Family Tree. Sophia attached to Sophia, Thomas Jacob attached to Thomas Jacob, and so forth. Okay, detach. That is useful if you find that a source has been added incorrectly. For instance, last night I was working with a stake member and somebody had attached an 1881 census to somebody that the person in the census had the same name, but they had a totally different family and were born in a totally different place. So as we checked into it, it became clear that that source was really not for the person whose page it was on. So we need to go ahead and detach that and explain what I just mentioned. Well, you know, the person was born in a different place, they've got a different family and so forth, and so this source doesn't really apply here, it applies to somebody else. And it's probably nice if you can actually find the person it applies to if they're in family tree and attach it to the right person. That's uh, just a little courtesy. 
there is also a report abuse function. And I have to say, I've never had to use this. I've never run across a source that was offensive, but the functionality is there in case you do. And it gives you the options for why something might be considered offensive. If it's, you know, probably, I don't know, has swearing in it or something with offensive or it's spam or it's political. Yeah, we don't really need that in Family Tree, right? If it's harassing, it infringes copyright or there might be some other reason. But anyway, if there is a source that you feel is inappropriate, this is how you can report it. And then usually when uh, my understanding is when abuse is reported, then Family Search contacts the person and gives them an opportunity to correct things. And then if the abuse continues, of course, they'll take further men measures. But I, they, I've noticed that's one thing I've really appreciated about Family Search is they're really good about working with their users. And so they'll try to solve the problem in, in a really positive way. Okay, now we come to one of my favorite functions here, which is tags. And I think that this might be a function that is not well understood and not well used. And so that's one reason why I wanted to go over it. So Family Search has defined these six tags that you see here. And when you are adding a source or when you click tag, you're going to see these tags. They're for different events or items, bits, bits of information in a person's life. And so you can choose to say that a source provides evidence of any of these tagged items. Well, you might be saying, well, that's all fine and good, but why is that useful and where does it show up? Well, one place, one very useful place that it shows up is on the detail page. So if I, for instance, wanted to see all sources that had been tagged to, uh, this is still for Thomas Joshua Gunton. So if I wanted to see all sources that had been tagged for his birth, I would click edit by his birth and I would get a list of all the sources that have been tagged. This is actually a fairly new feature and I think that is so awesome. Not only because it shows me the information that validates the birth data that's over here on the left, but also it gives sources extra emphasis. And I think that can only be good when it helps people realize how valuable it is to use sources in family history. Okay, so we were, just to go back and, and give us that context again, we've been in the source detail pop down and we've been looking at this top third of the page here, which basically is the title and all these menu options. Let's look at the next third, which covers the URL of the actual source and the indexed information. And they didn't used to have this displayed there, as I mentioned, but I am so glad they do now. It makes it so convenient. You used to have to click this URL and you still can. There's a little bit of extra information, but you had to click this to see this. But now they just have it right there on the page. And if you decide that it's too cluttered, you just click hide and it doesn't show anymore. And then if you want it again, you click show. This is so convenient because you can quickly spot check the basic information, the names, the dates, the places, the parents, and you've got easy access to an image if there is one for this particular source. You just click on this and it takes you right into the image viewer. Okay, we'll get rid of that. That was actually a genealogy message from my sister. I don't know if that came through, but... Um, that's exciting. Okay, so that's the, the second section of the source detail pop down. Let's look at the last one. Here we've got a citation and honestly, most regular users will not use this, but if you're a professional genealogist or if you keep Oh goodness, sorry about that. If you keep a log where you um, 
Okay. If you keep a log where you need a professional style source, then this is a great place where you can just copy and paste that source right out of here. But for most of us, I'm, I don't work as a professional genealogist. And so for most of us, this may not be something we'll ever use, but it's just nice to know that it's there. And then finally, at the bottom, you've got this, the status of the source. This is obviously attached, and it's when it was attached, and that's my username. But if it was someone else, it would tell you when that um, source was attached. I am so sorry. And I thought I disabled that, you guys. I apologize for that, those uh, little messages. And then finally, at the bottom, if there is a reason statement or if there isn't, uh, then you can you can you can edit it if it's there or if it's not there you can add it and I, I think those of you who have heard other webinars that I've given know that I'm just such a huge fan of reason statements because not only have they helped other people like I've really appreciated good reason statements that other people have written on records that I found but I myself have gone back to the items that I've maybe sources that I've added years ago and I come back and I'm like oh my goodness what was I thinking well if I've written a good reason statement I don't have to wonder it's right there so my reason statements have actually been helpful to me in addition to hopefully being helpful to other users I wanted to mention one more thing on the source detail here and that is that we're, we're see we're back here to the to the regular page a regular source tab. If you wanted to open all these sources at once and see all the detail at once, then you would just click open details and it would give you that pop down box for every source that's listed. Most of the time you're probably not going to want that because it makes the screen very long and very cluttered, but there's a chance that it would be useful to you. So I wanted to mention that at least that function's available. So the next two buttons, which we aren't going to talk about today, have to do with adding sources. So stay tuned for part two, and we will be covering that a week from today. And that actually concludes our webinar today. So it's a little bit shorter than usual, but I figured two short ones were probably better than one really, really long one. So today we covered the basics of sources and family history, and we reviewed some key features of the Sources tab. We talked about those icons. Remember, there's three different kinds. We talked about how you could reorder sources by dragging them, and we talked about viewing the source detail. We looked over the different menu options. We looked at the indexed information, and then we looked at the bottom section, which had the citation and the reason statement in it. So thank you everybody so much for joining us today. We appreciate it and hope to see you next week. And Marin, do we have any questions that we need to go over today? Uh, yes. Um, let me just go from the beginning. Um, let's see here. We have one. Um, it says, on source titles, maybe you want to speak to New England vital records that do not report birth, marriage, death in the title, but you need to add it later. Oh, wow. You know what? I was not aware of that. So thank you very much for bringing that up. That's a, another great example of why you might want to edit a source to add information that's missing from the title. Thank you very much for contributing that. And then we have a question from Debbie. Uh, she says, you showed an example where several people were all attached to one source. What do you recommend doing in those cases? Detach and reattach to each person individually? Yes, that's exactly what I would do, is detach the sources that don't really pertain to the person. And then what the easiest way to do it actually would probably be go back to the main person and then, sorry, you guys, that's so distracting. I, I don't know if you can see those messages popping up, but yeah. Um, I would go back to the main person and then click that review attachments link to get to the source linker. And then you could attach the source correctly to all the other people in the family. So thank you very much for asking that helpful question. Uh, what
Uh, looks like we have another question. Uh, the question is, if you use SourceLinker and gave a single name for the title of several people, can't you just change the names in the individual sources? Oh, Bob, that is a great question. And the reason that I probably wouldn't recommend that is that behind the scenes, I am, I don't know this for sure, but as speaking as a web developer, my guess is behind the scenes, there is still code that says that that source is for, let's say, let's go back to the John example, that that source is really for John. So even if you change the name to Susan, I'm guessing that on the back end, they still think it's for John that is still coded that way. So just to be safe, I would go to the source linker and I would use the family tree source linking functionality to attach the source rather than editing the name of the person. Great question. All right, I think that's all the questions we have for now. Uh, if you have any more questions, you're welcome to use the chat feature. I'll just move over to the closing screen and um, then we'll end the webinar. So next webinar, we will be having a follow-up with uh, Catherine on today's webinar um, with adding sources to the family tree. Um, that will be on the 13th next Thursday at 4 p.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. And the title of that webinar is Getting the Most from Family Search Family Tree, Adding Sources in the Family Search Family Tree. Um, and that will be the last webinar of 2018. And we hope that you have a happy and safe holiday. A uh, recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube page and on our website. And if you have any questions, suggestions, and comments, you're welcome to email us at fhl underscore webinars at byu.edu. We will be posting updates, uh, especially the recording of this video on our Facebook page, our Twitter, and our YouTube. So make sure that uh, if you'd like to share this in your Family History Center or with any of your relatives, that you uh, grab the link from there. Uh, thank you so much, and we hope that you have a wonderful weekend and hope to see you next Thursday.